In our last episode, we spoke about Huska Castle in the Czech Republic. Apparently, Huska Castle holds the gateway to hell. And even though the castle has been around for quite some time, we ended the episode speaking about the Nazi occupation of Huska Castle during World War II. And even though we don't necessarily have all the information regarding the Nazis in Huska Castle, we do have more information regarding the Nazis in a, another castle, a castle in Germany. But before we get started, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. If you want to support the channel, there is a Patreon link below. Or if you just want to do a one-time tip of the channel, we do have Venmo as well. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to be talking about Heinrich Himmler in Vigelberg Castle. said in our episode over Huska Castle, it is apparent that these castles were used as portals. Now with Huska Castle, so many people have had paranormal experiences there that it's not that odd to understand that the Nazis were doing something involving the occult in Huska Castle. Well, the same can be said for Vivelberg Castle in Germany. Now, of course, we know the Nazis were full of terrible, terrible ideas. But their ideas didn't come out of nowhere. These were ideas that were molded from the study of the occult and the particular interest in Germanic history. One person in particular became so obsessed with Germanic history and the occult that he himself decided Vivelberg would become the center of spiritual awareness for the Third Reich. Heinrich Himmler was born in Munich, Germany in 1900. Heinrich Himmler went on to become one of the leading men in the Nazi party. Himmler's family did have some connection to royalty. In fact, Himmler himself was named after Prince Henrik of Bavaria. And in fact, this prince was Himmler's godfather. You see, for most of Himmler's young life, he was Catholic. However, it appears that Himmler had a very awkward childhood. He, I guess, was sick a lot. I guess you could say he wasn't the cool kid in school. And we can look back at his diaries to kind of see this psychological breakdown. He, he wasn't the kid that was athletic. And even though he became such a forceful person in the Nazi regime, he didn't really do well with military training. The country that we know as Germany today has had a very interesting history of its own. We have the Holy Roman Empire, the impacts of Prussia. So much stuff happened within this one territory that what we think of Germany today really wasn't even established until 1871. And it isn't really important to mention that within the unification of Germany, there was a law that was passed where they, they made regulations where you couldn't discriminate against non-Christian people. Super interesting, right? Seeing that we've got the Holocaust right around the corner. But by 1922, we can see through Himmler's diaries that he's starting to take a very um, nasty viewpoint on a certain group of people. Around this time, while Himmler is getting his higher education, his parents also stumble upon hard times and cannot afford to continue paying his tuition. Now this is important in my opinion because obviously Himmler was a very um, nasty person. And you can see the frustration mounting with his parents and with his status in his own 
socioeconomic background as far as his peers. And so obviously he's taking all this shame, all this, this grossness coming from his situation and projecting it out to other people, if that makes sense. And by 1924, Himmler officially left the Catholic faith in order to study the occult and embrace this idea that for some reason Germanic people are superior, not because of the history we've necessarily been taught, but because of what he and a lot of his cromies in the, the Nazi party believed to be true. But we'll get deeper into what that faith was and what that belief looked like in a little bit. So with this growing aggression in Himmler's own personal life, his parents' inability to continue paying for his tuition, it's no shock that he joined the Nazi party in 1923. And two years later, he joined the SS in 1925. Now at this point, the SS was a very small group of people, about 290, 300 men, and their main prerogative was to protect Hitler. But by 1927, Himmler had convinced Hitler to allow him to change up the SS and turn it into what we think of the SS today. So within 16 years, the SS went to being this small, group of demented men to a million or so people involved in a movement. And by 1943, Himmler had positioned himself to basically be the commander in chief of the SS. Himmler was the man that was responsible for building the concentration camps, these quarantined camps, if you will, for people who were not of Germanic blood, mainly being the Jewish people and the gypsies. This also in included people who maybe were not the healthiest, maybe they had a disability. Anyone perceived to not be pure. But backing up a little bit, you see, when all this started happening and, and he started to gain more and more power from Hitler in the Nazi party, especially with his role with the SS, Himmler decided that he needed a headquarter for his glorious group of men. This headquarter would act as a school for the SS. In fact, I read that they called it the Nordic Academy. This place would also be the center, the mecca, if you will, for this Germanic religion that they were sure would end up being the main religion around the world once the Third Reich won the war, which they didn't win the war. And on top of that, Himmler was certain all of his SS members would end up becoming priests in this new world. So these military guys that are running these concentration camps were supposed to be our spiritual leaders. And on November 3rd, 1933, Himmler found just the place for his new mystic school, his, his Nordic Academy, his cathedral to beat all cathedrals, this, this new Vatican City for the Third Reich. And this, of course, was Vivelberg Castle. Now, Himmler didn't pick Vivelberg Castle because he liked the wallpaper. He picked Vivelberg Castle because of its location. And this is where we get into a little bit of what Himmler and his Nazi party believed. Now, I want to be very clear with you. Some of this stuff is recorded. The, the history of the Germanic tribe is recorded and is probably pretty accurate. If you can remember back a few episodes, we talked about the RH negative bloodline. Again, this is the bloodline that I carry. In fact, I myself would be considered someone of Germanic descent. You can tell by my coloring. Now in this RH negative video, which I will link below, we talked about where the RH negative blood like comes from that if we look at the science of the blood, just the science, 
it doesn't connect to the rhesus factor. Again, that's why you are RH negative. Well, the rhesus factor is named after the rhesus monkey, and so therefore, there are 15% of our world population that don't connect to evolution. So with that being said, there are a lot of mysteries around where we all come from. In my opinion, every blood group, regardless of what that is, tells us where our origins are. Only the elite group of people that have ruled our world don't want us to actually know what or where we come from. And even though all of our blood groups are different and might tell a different origin story for our specific lineage, in my opinion, it doesn't mean that any lineage is better than the other one. It's just different. It's just all a part of God's creation. And the Germanic story, the Germanic history of the people does align with the RH negative bloodline. And if you can remember two people who are RH negative, for the most part do have blonde hair, blue eyes, just like myself, they look very Germanic. Now that's not saying that someone of a different race can't carry the RH negative bloodline, of course they can. It's just more commonly found in people of Germanic or European descent. In fact, the bloodline itself is believed to have originated in Europe. Now we've also done videos on MK Ultra Mind Control and this idea of Operation Paperclip which is super important for anybody living in today's time to take a look at. Because with an Operation Paperclip, we see that a lot of these big, big people in the Nazi party were never tried or executed in the Nuremberg trials after World War II. In fact, a lot of them were taken to America. And if you study Operation Paperclip, you realize this belief, this Germanic belief of a superior bloodline is still very much alive and well. This is what the royal family believes, hence why the royal family has very suspicious ties to the Nazi party. They believe that this bloodline is special. They believe that this is the bloodline of a demigods. They believe that, that these people, like me with RH negative blood, are superior humans. I don't believe this at all, but they do. And this is what the Nazis believed. This was their religion. This was their occult persuasion, was to purify this Germanic blood that they believed they had rightfully inherited from their ancestors that set them apart from the rest of the world. And Vivalberg Castle was again a very mystical spot for this faith because this castle was by the Teutonberg Forest, which historically is a very important marker for Germanic history. Because you see, it was in uh, 9 BC that a group of Germanic tribesmen led by a man named Arminius defeated the Romans in the area and kicked them out. It was after this point that the Romans never really could go east of the Rhine River because the Germanic tribes were like, no, no, no. Now this battle that happened in 9 BC isn't just significant to Germanic history, it's significant to world history in a way. And, and in fact, there are many historians that have called this battle the, a turning point battle for the whole world. Now, Arminius himself was a Roman citizen, even though he was from a Germanic man, he had moved to Rome, gotten a citizenship in the Roman Empire, and had learned to fight with the Roman military. So when he came back home, he knew how to defeat these people. In fact, the Roman people didn't even see Arminius as as an outsider. They didn't see him as the enemy. They saw him as their friend, their comrade. So this battle was unexpected. And within three days, which again, the number three is a very occultic number, the Romans were gone out of this area. In fact, there is still a statue there for Arminius to signify this turning point in Germanic history. Again, all this stuff isn't bad. This is just what it was. And then in 98 AD, so roughly a hundred or so years after this famous battle, a Roman wrote a book called Germania. Now this battle affected the Roman Empire so much that even a hundred years later, they were calling this battle 
the greatest defeat the Roman Empire had ever had. And so this book, Germania, went around like crazy and describing these barbaric Germanic people north of Rome. These people were described in the book as being very, very fit, very big people with blue piercing eyes and hair of blonde and red. We go on to learn that the Germanic people themselves are actually Nordic. And if you have any type of European descent in you whatsoever, you probably will have a little bit of Scandinavian blood. I have Scandinavian in me. In fact, I had more Scandinavian in me than I actually realized. Now, for most people, we know this to be true because the Vikings went all around Europe, do you know, conquering and um, having their way with some of the other European ladies. And so most of us now do carry a bit of that Viking blood. For me, I like I said, I had more than I realized I should have had, but then my apparently my four times great grandmother was from Denmark, so there you go. So the belief is that the Germanic tribes came down from Scandinavia. They were again Nordic. So their lineage didn't start in sub-Sahara Africa. And that's why people of Germanic descent look so different, have piercing blue eyes, have light hair, have a different bloodline. And again, in my opinion, none of this is wrong. None of this is bad. We all originate from different places, but in my opinion, we're all equal. We're all created by God. It's okay to celebrate your heritage while you're also being respectful of other people's heritage as well. But obviously this was not Himmler's belief, nor is it our global elite's belief even today. Himmler believed that the Germanic tribes of people, these special people, were rulers of the earth and should take back their rightful place as demigods. And in fact, if you know anything about the Nordic faith or the pre-Christian faiths of Europe, if you're of European descent, most of your ancestors before the spread of Christianity were pagan. And so Hemmler really clinged on to this occult belief that the Germanic people were God's chosen people and the Christian faith was just a distraction just to take away from our own special unique powers as Germanic people and therefore we need to purify the Germanic people. We need to celebrate our place as demigods and we're going to start doing this at Vivalberg Castle on the site where Arminius defeated the Roman Empire back in 9 BC. So again, because of this, this place in Himmler's deluded mind was special and mystic. I'm not saying that Vivalver Castle isn't special. I believe portals are everywhere. But Himmler was obviously using these portals for bad, not for good. Now, Vivalver Castle was also used as a fortress against the Hungarians in the 9th and 10th century. And then in 1631, Vivalver Castle was also the location for some witch trials and apparently in the basement beside Hemmler's little room, which we'll get to in a minute, there was an inquisition room. Now, most of us know the witch trials of Europe and the Americas were horrific. So we have the energy of that there as well. The basement of Vivalberg was also used as a military prison during the Seven Years' War between the years 1756 and 1763. This castle is called the Nazi Castle of Doom. L literally, this is like the Castle of Doom, the Temple of Doom for its entirety, it seems like. Nothing but bad shit has happened here. But then from 1924 on, it was a cultural center until Himmler came around again in 1933 and was like, I think I'm going to use this castle for Nordic school and I'm gonna make myself like the head of it and all of our SS people are gonna be like these mystical priests in this fantasy world where th my Germanic people are somehow now demigods and ruling the planet. So finally, Himmler signed a 100 year lease for this castle, which we haven't hit the 100 year mark yet. So 
I guess the lease got voided when they lost the war. And then in January of 1934, they started renovations on the castle to build this school. Now they did a lot of work on the castle. Apparently, you know, the castle was really old. It definitely needed some upkeep. But let's get into what exactly Hemmler did in this castle because this castle was legitimately in my opinion, being designed to be almost like the new Vatican City for this weird faith that Hemmler found himself practicing. So if you took an aerial picture of the castle, the castle itself is in the shape of a triangle. Now we know this symbol, I'm not doing this symbol for nefarious reasons, but we do know this symbol is a Illuminati symbol, but this is the symbol of the castle, you have three different pillars with walls in between. And now the North Tower is where a lot of the real witchy stuff happened. In the North Tower, there was this room where he set up 12 pillars. Now the number 12 was really important to the SS. And bringing back the Teutonic folklore and history to the Nazi party, he decided that he was gonna name a lot of these rooms after Teutonic historical characters like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Now again, as I said, Germanic lineage isn't specifically to the country of Germany that we know today. This is all just Northern European people. Again, people like myself. This is where my ancestors are from, is Northern Europe, they're Nordic. And so these 12 pillars in the North Tower were supposed to be the new Knights of the Round Table. And so these 12 SS officers that were now the new Knights of Himmler's Round Table would, would perform occult rituals in this North Tower. They would go in there to do things that sounds a little bit like meditation, but I'm not 100% sure on that where they would try to commune with their Aryan or Nordic ancestors of the past, like the souls of these people that lived before them to China, try to hone in on their Germanic powers. Now, I'm not against you communing with your ancestors. I, I always appreciate when I feel like my ancestors are around me and protecting me. However, I don't want to take any power from them, nor am I trying to dominate anybody else. I don't believe, again, I don't believe that anybody is better than anybody else, regardless of where your ancestors are from. It's just where your ancestors are from. That's it. Now, because I know what I know about what they believe, and because I have an ancestor that, again, was born into this bloodline, I have a feeling that a lot of these occult rituals that took place at Vivalver Castle are probably very similar to the occult rituals that take place at Bohemian Grove and on Epstein's Island. I'm not going to go into detail about what those rituals look like. Most of us, especially those who of us who want the truth, already have a pretty good idea about what those rituals look like. And I will also attach a video below that I did long time ago regarding Bohemian Grove for those who maybe don't know what happens in those rituals. But moving on. Now I told you that there used to be an inquisition room next to the basement in Vivalberg Castle from the witch trials in the 1600s. Well, with Hemmler, the basement became a crypt. At the bottom of the basement, there was this huge swastika sign. And I guess this is where they like put a lot of the dead people from the SS because they were priests in this faith. Now, when it became apparent that the Third Reich was not going to win this war, Hemmler ordered Vivalver Castle to be destroyed. And so on March 31st, 1945, three days before the American troops got to Vivalverg, the castle was destroyed. So there's probably a lot of information that we still don't have about what happened under the Third Reich in this castle. Now, interestingly enough, Himmler, who had been very close to Hitler throughout their whole takeover of, of Europe and then of the world, decided that he was going to go and try to negotiate peace with the British. He was like, screw it, we're going to lose this war. And so I'm going to go try to 
turn state's evidence and give them all I got. Well, he got delayed in his plans and Hitler found out about it and ordered Himmler's arrest. Now, eventually the British troops did arrest Himmler and then Himmler committed suicide. On the 23rd of May, 1945, apparently he drank cyanide. Now we do know that according to our history books, the official story is that Hitler also committed suicide. And now we know that that's just BS. He didn't. He he was he didn't die that day. Now I don't know if the same is true for Hemmler, but I would not be surprised if Hemmler himself was also taken out of Germany through Operation Paperclip. Now the U.S. Army captain who ended up capturing what remained of Yvelver Castle found a silver box in the rubble. And this box contained a bunch of rings, about 200 rings. And he handed all these rings out to his troops, these American troops. Now these rings were called the SS Honor Rings. These rings were not a state decoration. Instead, they were personal gifts from Hemmler to his SS troops. Because as you can remember, the SS troops were not just supposed to guard the concentration camps and be just assholes, but they were supposed to be like the priest of this new, this new, this new world order that the Third Reich wanted to bring about. The SS troops were quote unquote supposed to be the vanguard in overcoming Christianity and restoring a Germanic way of life. The SS were not just people who signed up for the military like we have nowadays. The SS themselves had to prove through ancestry that they were purely Germanic people themselves. If an SS member wanted to get married, which was very much encouraged because they wanted people to have a bunch of little German babies, their wife, their pending wife, their fiance also had to prove to the Third Reich that they too were of pure Germanic lineage. So these rings were very special rings. Now for those who've studied the cult of Saturn or the cult of Satan, we know that our wedding bands, any type of ring that we're giving in love to someone else is a representation of the rings of Saturn. These rings represented in full force the Germanic mysticism. In fact, uh, there was a skull and bones on the outside with the recipient's name on the inside with the date the ring was given and Himmler's signature on the inside of the ring. Letters from Himmler with the ring would go on to say, quote, remember at all times to be willing to risk the life of ourselves for the life of the whole, end quote. Now these Germanic rings, these skull and bone rings, remind me of something else we have here in the United States of America. Something again that points back to Operation Paperclip. Something again that points back to the fact that all of our presidents are possibly, allegedly, descendants of these Nazis, these SS members. And of course, I'm referring to the Skull and Bones Club, the secret society. Now, it's not just presidents who are also members of these collegiate secret societies that have their roots in the SS, in the Nazi occultism, but there's also media personalities who were also a part of this group of people, one in particular, again, being Anderson Cooper, who was a Vanderbilt. And is also one of the people that sits on the news every day and tells you what to think in the manner of Operation Mockingbird that comes from Operation Paperclip that comes from the Nazi party. But anyway, back to these fantastic rings. In 1938, Himmler ordered that all the rings of deceased SS members who died in battle to be sent back to the castle to be buried on the grounds of the castle. And then in 1944, he ordered that all the rings be sent back to the castle. And I'm sure what they were doing when they were bearing these rings was probably 
a ceremony of sorts. Now, of course, there are many rings that are hidden still buried somewhere in the property of this castle. But the 200 rings that the army, the US Army Captain Black found, he did give out to his troops. And apparently there are about 3,500 SS rings that are floating around out there in the world. And of course, because they're rare and because of their significance with our history, they're very valuable. So if you find a ring in your grandparents' attic that represents or looks like it might be an SS ring, you're sitting on a on a an artifact of history. So now we know that there's a lot of connections between the occult practices of the Third Reich and our ruling elite today. We've talked about the skull and bones, we've talked about the Rh negative blood factor, we've talked about the fact that they actually actually believe that a certain form of human is like a demigod and needs to rule the earth. We know that they're satanic. We know that they worship Lucifer. We know that they worship Moloch and Baal. However, we also need to look at the concept of eugenics, which was a science that was established around 1920. Now this eugenics was about breeding out people who were not considered to be pure. Now, of course, overtly, the Nazis practiced this in their concentration camps by quarantining, their words, quarantining people that were not of this bloodline, whether they were a Jewish or a gypsy or maybe had a feeble constitution. They also practiced sterilization. So people that they didn't deem to be worthy of procreating were often sterilized against their will. They also legally bred people. We've talked about this concept before with the Georgia Guidestones. The Nazis' belief in eugenics isn't dead. In fact, it's very much alive. In fact, there's somebody in our media, in our spotlight today, that is a proponent of eugenics. That is Bill Gates makes you think twice about getting a vaccine from him. And I know this information is a lot, and, and honestly, we're just able to really skim the surface of everything there is to learn about what Hemmler believed and how he used, with the Nazi party, used these particular castles within interesting history to conduct occult rituals. Again, I want to emphasize that occult rituals are not necessarily a bad thing themselves. Occult just means secret or hidden. Some occult rituals could be a Catholic service that's honoring Jesus. But I don't think that's what the Nazis were doing, and I know for damn sure that is not what people are doing at Bohemian Grove and on Epstein's Island. Now, we will be going deeper into this castle and into the cultic practices of the Third Reich on David Zublick's channel this Tuesday. If you were not able to join us last Tuesday when we talked deeper about Huska Castle on David's channel, please go back and watch that episode. We talked a lot about consciousness and what time really is, and, and that is something I really enjoy being able to do because on this channel, all I'm really doing is telling you the information in the form of a story. It's basically an outline for you to then be able to go and do your own research. And again, I always want you to do your own research. But we will be taking a deeper look on Tuesday into Vivalberg. If you have any questions or if there's something you didn't quite understand with the story, send me an email at esotericatlanta at gmail and I'll look into it before we have our episode with David or you can also leave a comment below. Sometimes I do miss comments, um, so emailing might be better. If you have sent me an email and I have not responded yet, I promise you I'm gonna respond. It's just gonna take me a minute. Um, got some other stuff going on, so when I have a chance to sit down and actually give you a proper response, I will because you deserve a proper response. Also, if you haven't given us a follow on social media, go ahead and follow us on Instagram at Esoteric Atlanta. The bigger our channel gets, the more I wanna involve you in decisions about the channel, and that's the best way for me be, to be able to reach you as a collective whole. All right, guys, thank you again for sitting through another story. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I will hopefully have another video for you guys before Tuesday. I'm planning on it. Um, 
Otherwise, I will see you on Tuesday on David's channel. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music and to Todd Roderick for helping me edit and helping me with production. I hope you guys have a fantastic day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.